everyone from Hotjar, I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here, and I have a ton to get through. Uh, so uh, I'll just say I, a few folks came up to me in the hallway, um, Pradeep included, and, and read a post of mine from last week and said very nice things, and uh, that is very humbling and wonderful to hear. Uh, so thank you for that. All right. So you all know that most, <laughs> most of these uh, marketing strategies, many of which I have stood on stages and walked people through and recommended and showed tactics of how to do it and how to do it better, don't work no more. <laughs> uh, strategies like uh, the performance advertising barrage, most of you have probably tried it, many of you are probably still in some companies that are attempting to do this, in the age of cheap VC money, the answer was like just throw dollars at you know, all these unprofitable channels until we get enough customers that we can become a monopoly and, <laughs> and, and further wealth inequality. It seems like an odd goal. I don't know. I know some venture capitalists, they seem nice, but they get up in the morning and they're like, I want to make the rich richer and everybody else a little poorer. It's weird. Uh, the SEO and content flywheel, obviously when I was at Moz, my previous company, I talked a lot about this one. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. The influencer marketing takeover, which had kind of its heyday over the last six, seven years. I think it's actually on the way down, although I would argue there's still some value to influencer stuff. Big, splashy media launch. Occasionally, a few companies will decide that the, like, this is how they're going to do everything. They love that like big PR event. For some people, it still works. Go viral on social. You know, this was like the dream of the 2010s. Uh, it's still alive in Portland. <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I'm not saying that none of these work anymore. What I'm saying is that they can be viable in like a holistic campaign setting, but, but you can't just throw this one strategy out there as your whole marketing uh, process and expect to win. Not anymore. Wh why not? Why not? It seems... It seems are you sure about this, Ram? What, what, what really happened that took away the value of a bunch of these things? I'm going to walk you through a few trends that have taken them away. The first one is massive upheaval in ad tech. So, you know, the death of third-party cookies, right? The, the not death, but lowering of value, significant lowering of value of first-party cookies, too. Also, a ton of ad blocking and a lot of blocking of the things that let us track ad tech in the ways that were, that were perfect, including multi-device journeys, right? Including uh, people using different kinds of browsers, Brave in particular, uh, Firefox, right? Apple, Safari, which Apple devices in general, which kind of block all the great Facebook tracking. If you've seen your Facebook value go down significantly with iOS users, that's part of why. Uh, yeah, these, these things have been rising. Uh, I think the right answer here is just to forget about tracking the full user journey before a person logs in. Once a person's logged into your website, giving you their email address, sure. Yes, I believe then you can start to track their behavior after that so long as they remain logged in. But before that happens, if you're trying to build a user journey, you know what you're going to build instead? An ad journey. I'm serious, because ads are the only thing that persistent track, and only some of them, also, a lot of the stuff that, that we take for granted in the United States that we can track is not legal in other parts of the world. So just be aware, right? If you have customers in the EU in particular, soon in Canada potentially, soon in California potentially, probably none of you have customers in California. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think New Yorkers have even heard of California. Uh, <laughs> You can still use Google Analytics on your website. I use it on SparkToro. <laughs> right? Like in the EU, it's kind of like a, someone from Germany will always come at me. Well, yes, technically it is possible to install the Google Analytics, but you must uh, break all the functionality. It's okay, I'm Jewish, it's cool. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have time to tell this story, but I really want to tell this story. One time they asked me to uh, introduce the German Search Awards, this is several years ago, and uh, you know, I got up on stage and I do speak a little bit of German, so I, better at the time, so I, I introduced myself and the award category in German, everything else had been in English, because Germans are extremely accommodating. And, 
and the, the host comes up to me after, and he, uh, you know, on stage, and he's like, wow, Rand, your German is, is really pretty good. It was not. And I was like, yeah, you know, if you want someone to present an award in Germany, you got to invite the Jew. And the whole crowd, <laughs> except one table of Brits who are just crying laughing. It was great. It was a great, great, great day. Okay, number two, big lies about buyer journeys. So if you've heard the like, oh, let's just spend more on ads, like Rand's essentially saying the big tech advertisers, they're the only ones you can really track. They're the only ones you can really attribute. Yeah, well, there keep being story after story of big advertisers cutting hundreds of millions of dollars of ad budget and seeing improved results. Ah, what's going on? Now, granted, Airbnb is struggling, but I think that's on the product side, not the marketing side. And in this case, they really did. They took their advertising nearly down to zero and saw the same results. That is scary as heck. If you are a performance advertiser and you are not regularly turning off your ads and seeing if the conversions come anyway, you're in trouble. You are wasting those dollars, I promise you. And a lot of CMOs and CEOs and CFOs are basically looking at the attribution that those big ad tech companies provide and being like, well, that's where I'm putting my budget. And I think that's a mistake. All right, I, I, one more brief story, two more brief stories, but, but, but one real here. So this uh, pizzeria in, in Milan, this didn't really happen, but I like to tell this story. I didn't come up with this, by the way. This is a long time advertising story. So this uh, pizzeria in Milan, the owner decides that she would like to get more business for her pizzeria. So she's like, hey, I'm gonna hire three neighborhood scamps, right, to come and distribute flyers, a green one, a red one, and a white one. They're gonna have discount code on them, so I'll know if anybody you know, comes to the pizzeria because of the, the flyers. So kids go out for a month, she looks at the data after 30 days, and she's like, oh my God, this kid with the green flyer. It's crushing it. How, like 40% of my new business is coming in, coming in from this one kid. Everybody else is like 5%. Okay, other two, you're fired. Kid, keep doing what you're doing. Six months later, she checks in with her accountant. She's like, hey, how's business? How are we doing? I, I know tons of people have been using the coupon. She's like, yeah, well, business is up about 10%, but a lot of people are using this coupon and getting half off, so yeah, you're actually down a little bit in sales. What? How can that be? I know that I'm getting way more new customers because they're coming in with the green flyer. So what does she do? She puts on a disguise and she follows the kid, very Italian, right? Put on a disguise, wig, follow the kid. Uh, what does she see? Yeah, he's got the green flyers. And he ducks into an alley around the corner from the pizzeria. And whenever he sees anybody who looks like they're about to walk into the pizzeria, he jumps out, hands him the flyer. Because why would you work hard to make more sales when you could just take credit for the sales that were already gonna happen? AKA Google and Facebook's motto. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, this, 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 what's what happened? Yeah, Alex knows, right? So I, this, is my, this is my general opinion. Over the last two decades, attribution was always a lie. You could measure a lot more things than you can measure today. 2013, absolutely. You could measure, you know, which keywords sent me traffic, all, all this kind of stuff, right? But the full life cycle attribution was always a lie, and it still is. And if you think you have a perfect attribution model because you're running econometrics and a marketing mix modeling system that uses artificial intelligence, and my friend, I guarantee what you are really measuring is which ads got seen by people who converted. That's what you're really, really seeing. All right, number three, Google being Google. <laughs> hey, have you been, have you, you've been listening at all to the Department of Justice case against Google the last few weeks? Oh, 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 oh man. I mean, Sundar was up there yesterday, Monday, and uh, geez, just tear them a new one. Oh my God. It was kind of, kind of delightful to watch, right? Because, well, because he, a few years ago, he testified in front of Congress, right? And, and I, I was so pissed off by his testimony and the fact that Congress 
they, you know, they were kind of holding his feet to, a, to the fire. Like I was, I was mildly impressed by the knowledge of, of Congress people, which it's a low bar, <laughs> but mildly impressed. And then, and then he just lied to them. And I was like, I can prove he's lying. I'm gonna, and I wrote this blog post. I did some research and, and wrote this blog post about it. In, in fact, this is, I'll show you the blog post in a second. But as marketers, right, we forget how it used to be. It used to be like, oh, I can see that that keyword sent me this much traffic, and if I ranked higher, I would get that much traffic, and so I'm just gonna do that. But 2023, Google was, you know, over the last 10 years, Google's been answering more and more queries directly in the results. Two thirds of searches end without a click, right? You Google how, you know, how old is Alec Baldwin? And they're like, here's the answer. Why, don't click on anything, right? A lot. This is infuriating and wrong, but lots of people Google Rand Fishkin and then the, the first, you know, the auto suggests says net worth. It's weird. Or wife, which that one I get. I mean, like, <laughs> Geraldine. <sighs> yeah. Everybody should be searching for that. But like, Rand Fishkin net worth. And then the, it gives an instant answer from a blog post from like a spammer in 2009, like SEO spammer. I, I mean, I would like that number to be true. That looks, that's a great number to me, but I check my bank account, doesn't look like that. Oh, oh, weird. All right, so answering more and more of these searches. Uh, there, also, I hate that they're doing this. You know when you bid on a keyword in Google? They're conflating that keyword with a bunch of other keywords that they think are similar, and you don't get to control it until you go and manually exclude it, and then they'll just conflate a bunch more, and then you have to go manually exclude those. And then the algorithm changes and they conflate more and man, these, the performance max thing. Oh, I don't know, a lot of people on the internet are complaining that that's, that's just like a whole scam. And uh, this is, these are not alone, right? They're switching to less granular behavior tracking. They cut out in GA, they cut out a bunch of attribution models. Uh -huh, probably because those attribution models were not positively correlated with more ad spend. And then they literally, the, this was from the trial two weeks ago. This is from the DOJ trial. It's a, it, not a leaked email, right? Like the Department of Justice subpoenaed and Google, thank God, didn't delete it because they did delete a bunch of stuff. I don't know if you saw the judge had to go out for that. Uh, this email is from one of the executives on the ad team to the rest of Google, to the rest of Google's execs saying, yo, quit making results so good. You gotta tone it down or we're not gonna get our bonuses. Let's dial it back. He didn't say it exactly that way, but close enough, close enough. All right, number four, dark social. Ooh, so <laughs> I look in our analytics, right? And I'm like, ooh, 76% of my visitors are coming from direct? Are they, are they typing in these URLs? It seems weird. Sparktoro.com slash blog slash zero hyphen click hyphen content. No way, can't be, it's impossible. 29% of that is homepage. So we ran an experiment with, uh, with Steve from Really Good Data. He's awesome, Steve Lamar. And if you click on a link in someone's TikTok profile, you get no tracking. There is no attribution. TikTok intentionally hides the refer string, blocks the refer string. You will never know that that visitor came from TikTok. This is also true of WhatsApp. This is also true of Discord, for those of you in the video game world. This is also true on Slack on Mastodon, come on Mastodon. I know there's like one and a half million users and I'm probably the most active person there, but still. Slack, hidden, all those private Slack communities in B2B that are sending you traffic, you cannot attribute to them. You don't know that that's where the traffic came from. This, this, is, this is like huge all over. The weirdest ones are LinkedIn, which is like 25% uh, non-attributed. Why? Why are you hiding the refer a quarter of the time? Very strange, I don't understand. Twitter is actually quite reliable, but of course Elon has tried to, <laughs> tried to destroy links on Twitter and destroy Twitter itself and destroy the free world and, <laughs> whew, man. Uh, all right, number five, rise of zero click everything. So all these platforms that I've just discussed, uh, right, Iwana, Iwana was just up here talking about how they're using these AI recommendation systems, right, to show you what you wanna see what, what they think you wanna see. And what they, <laughs> what they know that many of us would like to see are links. And they are intentionally suppressing those. 
right? So URLs just don't perform. I, I find it's about uh, 10%, right? Like 10% of the clicks and engagement that you would get on a post on any of these platforms is what you get if you have a link. And you get 10 times that amount, 100%, if you don't have a link. Ugh, man. If you're a marketer and you've been trained in like the 2010 style of post your content to social and like share it out so that people will click on it, that's, that's just not how it works, right? So Amanda, my colleague, VP marketing at, at SparkToro, there's only three of us, but uh, we have fancy titles, right? Because there's three of us, you get to decide your title. Uh, so Am Amanda was like, I'm calling this zero click marketing. And I was like, yes, that is exactly what's happening because Essentially, every single network is trying to not let anyone leave. They want you to stay on their site. That's how they make money. And number six, the end of the rising tide. So, internet growth slowed down dramatically, right? Like, like there's just not more human beings coming online. I think we're only, what are we, like 15 or 18 years away from peak human population too, right? And then it's gonna start shrinking. That'll be fascinating. What's gonna happen to real estate? It's gonna be so weird when I'm in like my 70s and 80s and there's just lots more places than there are people. I don't know, it's uh, strange. Uh, shrinking search availability, right? Clicks available in search, which I did some research on that as well. Uh, shrinking growth of Facebook daily active users. This is not shrinking in terms of there are fewer of them. This is the growth rate has slowed, right? There's more people on the internet every day. I think LinkedIn came out with a stat this morning that Every, uh, every second of every day, four people sign up for, an account, for a LinkedIn account. So there's, there's more, it's just slowing. It is not rising the way it was. And as a result, media spend, advertising, digital ad growth revenue, also not growing the way it used to. This, I think this chart is really interesting because look, these are the big incumbents, right? This is where all that like activity, the, the growth rates, the high growth rates, Walmart, because you could barely use their website for advertising like five years ago, right? Like it, it was totally impossible. I mean, tick, TikTok did, did not have ads five years ago, so obviously they're gonna have growth, but not, it's not the same as Meta and Google and Microsoft growing. All right, so what, what do you do? My suggestion is, if you are considering, you, your marketing team, your CMO, your CEO is considering one of these, right? The performance advertising barrage, the content flywheel, influencer marketing, whatever. Instead, I'm gonna suggest an alternative. And I'm calling it audience first marketing. Audience first marketing. So, uh, February 27th, 2018, uh, my last day at Moz, this unhappy picture of me was taken by, I think by my assistant. And it was pretty, it was a dark day, very dark day because um, I, thought, I thought Moz was gonna be my, my career for forever. I thought I was gonna um, make that company, you know, a home run for its investors and like this in incredible juggernaut and maybe we'll go public someday or sell for a lot. And um, when I left, I, I, I the next day, I started SparkToro. I took like a whole eight hours off. <laughs> and it, look, part of it is because, yes, right? Like I had a chip on my shoulder, I, I needed to do this. But also because we had a mortgage to pay and we needed healthcare, right? Uh, most of you know, right, that like Geraldine kind of famously had this brain tumor a few years ago. The operation was a success, like everything's good, but like we cannot have a gap in our health insurance or shit gets cray. This is the United States. For those of you who don't know the United States, it's pay to play even at the hospitals, yes. So, you know, I started this company, SparkToro, um, and with SparkToro, like, it, it's been a really, really wonderful, amazing journey. This is me and my co-founder, Casey, and Amanda, um, getting filmed for a docu-series um, that actually that LinkedIn and HubSpot were doing. I think, I think it's launching in a few weeks, actually. But you, here, I'll show you the, the net net, right? So this is essentially, you know, launch, well, ra raise some money, did not raise from VCs. I'm happy to talk to anybody about that. I don't recommend it. This, you know, it takes us about a year and a half to build the product and launch, it has, it has no AI. <laughs> um, 
October 2020, break even. Which, which blows Casey and I's mind, right? Like, this is amazing. We're not, I mean, our salaries aren't huge, our expenses are, are relatively low, but this is exciting. Pass a million ARR, I think we're up over one and a half now, and June of this year, we got to pay our investors back, which I know is a weird model, but then we get to pay dividends ongoing, which is uh, also a weird model, but we, we really like it that way. And essentially, we do no advertising, and we get no search traffic, none. If you look at our Google Search Console, the only keywords in there are SparkToro and terms related to our brand, right? Like we get some search now for zero-click marketing, a phrase that Amanda coined, but we don't even rank well for it. <laughs> it's like our SEO is just terrible. Um, it's essentially that we get featured on podcasts and in webinars and on popular YouTube channels and written about in other people's email newsletters and blogs, and I don't know what to call this. Right? I don't think this thing has a name. This basically go market to the sources of influence that reach your audience, and that's why I'm calling it audience first marketing. It works because we get the right message to the right audience at the right time in the right place, which that's the whole thing of marketing, right? Like that's all that a marketer's job is. So I have, I have to end this out, I'll, I'll give you just a few tips on each of these. When we thought about the right message, I messed it up a bunch. I, got, I messed up, I, I don't know if anybody remembers, but uh, SparkToro used to be, when I, you know, we, when I talk about it, I would say it was, we were audience intelligence. People are like, what, what is that? I don't, I don't know what that is. So, we, we worked with Asia Arangio from Demand Maven, right, and she has these like three core questions that she asks. What is the customer hiring the product for? Are they achieving the success? What's blocking them from achieving the success? And, how they, how people described our product when we started, when I started messaging, like, oh, people call it audience research. I'm gonna call it audience research. Do you know we actually started ranking, nobody searches for audience research tools, but we actually started ranking well for it too when we changed the name, right? Called it the thing that other people called it. Conversion rate went up, uh, lifetime value went up, right? Use went up, all those kinds of things. And, you know, if, <laughs> if not, if they're not achieving this success, then that's either the wrong customer or you've made the wrong product. And, you know, in this case, right, I'm trying to, like, remove these roadblocks, and that's, that's where the results come from. And so, process-wise, I, I know a lot of people, a lot of startups especially, will stand on stage and they'll be like, founders, you need to do this. You need to interview your customers. And I actually disagree. I don't think it works so well. Casey disagrees too. He's like, no, when I see when you get on the phone with somebody, Rand, or you show them something, you know, you sit down at a conference and you're showing them SparkToro, you get all excited about it. I do, I get really excited. I'm like, look at this and you can do this. Oh, and we can apply it this way and da, 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 da. And he's like, that's not what we're trying to do here, right? What we're trying to do is get information from people about how they'd use it apart from how interested they are in you as a person, right? And so a third party, they will be honest with. And this is what Asia does, right? She interviews, we, we have all these video recordings of her like talking to a bunch of our customers and potential customers where she asks these questions and then she builds this board and it's awesome. I highly recommend outsourcing uh, that process. Okay, right audience. Your audience is not your customers. Your audience for your marketing is not your customers. I, can, I, I wanna give a whole 30 minute talk on just that. I think it'd be, be helpful, right? So there's current customers, people who bought your product, there's, there's potential customers, there's potential amplifiers. Look, I don't, I have no idea whether Hotjar and Mo are like users of SparkToro. Like Pradeep said he's a user of SparkToro, that's awesome, thank you. Totally appreciate it, especially because we're no AI and so, you know, I don't even know, like why bother, right? Um, but, but, right, big, big amplifier. And, the, and th there's this broad community, right, of all these people who talk about marketing things and talk about tech things and talk about audience things. And if you ignore these people, and like most companies, unfortunately, put all your effort into these two, you're gonna have a bad time. Because the stuff that's interesting to these two groups, which is often like, hey, how to use the product better, and like, how do I apply it to your particular job, that is not worth amplifying. That's not worth spreading to a new audience, a bigger audience, right? So I tried to visualize this like, with like a Venn diagram, right? 
Potential customers, they sit inside the broad industry. Current customers, hopefully they're a smaller group than, than your potential customers. And then the amplifiers who are sort of like, eh, right? There's even some who are outside your community, like journalists, right? Like broad journalists. And the most successful marketing is the one that intersects there, which is not obvious. It's not intuitive, and it's not how most marketing is targeted. We have the most success with that particular group, right? The podcast hosts, the event organizers, the bloggers, the people with LinkedIn audiences, the marketing YouTubers, like that's our people. That's who we create marketing content for because they're gonna amplify it and that will bring people back to SparkToro and then they can try a free account and th th that's how we sort of move them through the funnel. I, I won't spend a bunch of time on right time, but essentially I think about it like this. There's this um, behavioral psychology idea of a, an influence map right, which is, okay, during all these stages, your job is to figure out how your customers interact with these different stages and where they do it, right? So like each step of the journey, they're sort of figuring it out and, and your job is to figure out, well, which one are we having a problem with and then where do I wanna spend my time and effort? And the last one, I will spend my last couple of minutes here on uh, right place. So. <laughs> All right, another story. It's a deep pandemic, January 2021. We've just canceled a trip to Costa Rica that I was looking forward to for like two years. Um, this is before Moz sold, right? So like we kind of lost some money and I was like, oh. <laughs> mm. So what am I doing? I'm doing like many Americans and cooking a whole ton. <laughs> like I channel, I channel all my, channel all my like energy into cooking. And I get obsessed with a bunch of Japanese recipes and this website called Just One Cookbook, which is run by a Japanese woman who, um, I think she's in San Francisco or the West Coast, but she writes all these great recipes. So she keeps talking about the donabe, which the donabe is like pinnacle of how you cook Japanese rice. Um, and I was like, oh man, all right, you know what? <laughs> it's 300 and some odd dollars. Uh, I gotta get a donabe. I, Freaking love this thing. I'm, I think I'm, clo I'm getting close to, it has cost me only like $1 per use now, right? <laughs> For, I made a lot of rice, like I really have. I haven't burned it yet either. I'm like, you know, this is apparently what happens. So why, why did I, why did I order this? Well, because I follow Just One Cookbook for forever and I subscribe to learn about specifically this stuff, right? I, I like them. Their past recommendations have always been solid. Like they told me which kind of rice to buy and that was great, right? And they have no vested interest. Like it's not, they have an Amazon affiliate link. No, they don't because you can't buy it on Amazon. So there's no affiliate link either. I think you have to buy it from this Toiro, Toiro Kitchen .com, or at least I did when I bought it. And this is already in my reading list. And this is my opinion, right? That publications, people, podcasts, video creators, social accounts, all that stuff that match the criteria of familiar, liked, trusted, perceived as impartial, right? and easily available to your audience. These are the best marketing opportunities, full stop. That's it. This is audience first marketing, like you're in these right places. I, I kind of don't care about the number of social followers or third party estimates of traffic or domain authority. I know I created domain authority, but I don't care. <laughs> or where they rank in Google's results, like I D G A F. I don't gamble against fallacious metrics. Everybody knows that's what that stands for, right? I, no, this is, what I, this is what we try to do, right? So this is SparkToro, and actually this is the new V2 of SparkToro. I was super excited, because in V1, the screenshot's not nearly as good. You have to scroll way down to find them. But I was like, oh, new V2. Okay, Just One Cookbook has high, very high affinity with the audience who is interested in Donabe's. Hmm, no surprise, look at that. So this is how our marketing flywheel spins. Oh, I'm out of town, sorry. Uh, we find a source that reaches our audience. We provide unique value to earn their attention we try and wow that audience, right? Like we want them to be impressed by what we're doing. Uh, Amanda has so many wonderful, smart things to say. Casey can build so much cool software, right? I uh, um, am the fit model for most men's jackets in size 38. <laughs> so, you know, and, and then we bring them to our website and we try to turn their audience into our audience. And then we spin this flywheel again. And I'm gonna tell you right now, year one, this was very hard. Year two, it got a lot easier. Year three, it's turning, it's spinning on its own. People reach out to us, they ask us to come 
and be on their events and do their podcasts and their webinars because they saw somewhere else. And remarkably, this, product, this process feeds into all these things, right? It's going to make your performance advertising campaign work better because if people know you, like you, trust you, have heard of you from sources they trust, they will click your ads, they will convert on your website. It will help every SEO and content flywheel because a lot of those people link and mention you. It will help with search generative experience sorts of snippets. It will help with influencer marketing. It's going to help with that splashy media launch. Whatever the thing you're doing is, this process also helps. Like a, it is beneficial regardless. I hope you give it a try. Thank you very much.